Uh, my name is Samir Kioli. I am one of the course directors for Cancer Center Grand Rounds here in Arizona. Also joining me today are my fellow course directors, Dr. Alex Sekulik, Dr. Allison Rosenthal, and Dr. Vinnie Ernani. And we also have a special panelist joining us from Mayo Clinic Rochester, Dr. Vincent Rajkumar. Uh, you may know Dr. Rajkumar as a world expert in multiple myeloma, but he also has an interest in uh, pharmaceutical costs and how to better control them and writes quite a bit about this, both in the literature and on Twitter. A few months ago, uh, as uh, Mark Cuban's cost plus drug company uh, was starting to gain more traction on social media and other forums, I think it became evident to us, uh, this is a, a real disruptor in the marketplace, but it's not clear uh, I think to many pro, uh, providers who are prescribers on how to best access this pharmacy. And so to that extent, I sent a random email to Mark Cuban uh, telling him that I think this is a, a very interesting and disruptive uh, solution to a big problem, but uh, awareness uh, needed to be raised in the prescriber community. To my surprise, uh, uh, Mr. Cuban responded to me in about uh, 20 minutes and then copied his CEO, Dr. Alex Ashmansky, Ashmansky, and this dialogue began leading to this grand round. Uh, joining us today is the CEO of the Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drug Company, Dr. Alex Ashmansky. He has one of the most interesting uh, histories that I've uh, read. Uh, he doesn't actually have a CV, but he does have a Wikipedia page, which says something. And uh, we were talking a little bit before the grand rounds. He grew up in Denver, and graduated from the University of Colorado at Boulder at the age of 18. And then he attended Duke University for medicine. He completed a PhD uh, at, as a Marshall Scholar at the University of Oxford, then went to Harvard for an internship, Johns Hopkins for a residency in diagnostic radiology, and he still practices as a radiologist. And uh, he will give the story on how he connected with uh, Mark Cuban and his interest in pharmaceutical costs in, in pharmacies. But uh, it's really a remarkable story and we hope you enjoy today's Grand Rounds. And we'll have a fun and robust dialogue afterwards as well. Well, first of all, thank you everyone. I really appreciate the, the invitation to, to be here today. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to, to be speaking. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, today just wanted to walk everyone through kind of uh, the history of the company, kind of how it started, and go into what we view as some of the, the issues with the pharmaceutical supply chain and how we propose to, to get around them. So, you know, it, it's obvious, but I always like to include just the disclosure. I'm obviously a, a shareholder in the, the Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drug Company. And also just want to acknowledge uh, Antonio Chacha from, from Three Axis Advisors, uh, who helped uh, put together many of the slides I'll be, I'll be showing today. Uh, and yeah, to start with, uh, I generally like to, to go over uh, the history of our company, kind of how we, how we got here before I go into the discussion of, what we, of the, the pharmaceutical supply chains themselves. Um, so actually started uh, what would become this company back in 2015. Uh, at the time, there was a, a character, Martin Shkreli, uh, who you guys may, may or may not remember, you know, uh, sort of a notorious social media villain uh, who raised the price of uh, Daraprim, uh, generic paramethamine, uh, by several tens of thousands of percent overnight, and, and a particularly sort of histrionic personality and caught a lot of social media attention. And, uh, you know, would all do naivete, myself and some physician colleagues, uh, infectious disease doctors, uh, decided, you know what, why don't we just start up a nonprofit pharmaceutical company? Uh, you know, we'll just make the, we'll just make the drugs, sell them at cost and, and go from there. And we did. Uh, we set up a 501c3 uh, and yeah, sort of went out uh, looking for financing for that for the better part of three years. Uh, and did not succeed, uh, failed spectacularly, did not raise a, a single dollar beyond uh, what I put in myself. Uh, eventually got connected to a group of uh, venture capitalists in, in Silicon Valley, uh, a group called Y Combinator, uh, who periodically donate to nonprofits and sort of went to them and pleaded my case. Uh, 
And they said, hey, we like what you're doing. We'd, we'd like to, to back it, but we don't think you'll be able to raise enough money uh, to get this off the ground as a nonprofit. Uh, if you reincorporate into a, a for-profit, what's called a public benefit corporation, so a uh, for-profit company with, with a stated public mission that's registered with the state, uh, we'll invest in you like we would in any other company. Uh, after three years of no success, I figured, you know what, why not? Let's give it a shot and see what happens. Uh, and uh, yeah, to their credit, they were right. Uh, after a few months of working with that group, was able to raise what in in pharmaceutical dollars is a, a small amount uh, to get us kicked off and off the ground, a little bit over a million dollars. Uh, and yeah, started work. Uh, and honestly, just on a whim, uh, kind of emailed Mark Cuban at his public email address, mcuban at gmail.com, uh, and expected nothing to happen. But surprise, surprise, he actually does read all his public email, not, not one of his you know, assistants, he personally does. And uh, he got back to me uh, and we started a dialogue and uh, yeah, he started a invested a, a small amount uh, to start out with, but yeah, became uh, obviously increasingly enthusiastic about the project uh, over time. And now we have sort of two different business divisions under the same corporate umbrella at Mark Cuban Cost Plus. Uh, one is our manufacturing division. Uh, so just like the initial vision of the company, uh, we are a true pharmaceutical manufacturer. Uh, so across the street from me here in Dallas, Texas, uh, we're building a uh, what's called a sterile fill finish facility. Uh, so that's a facility that uh, will make sterile injectable products. Uh, in, particu in particular, we have a very strong focus on rare disease, orphan products, uh, rare dis uh, shortage products in particular. Uh, sort of, I like to say we will make the drugs nobody else wants to make, either because the community that needs them is too small or the profit margins are too narrow uh, and you wind up getting sort of these recurrent drug shortages. Uh, so that facility has been uh, under design, under construction for about three years, but we're getting very close. Uh, should start operations after our, what's called commissioning qualification validation process. So like an FDA approval process uh, by November of this year at the rate we're tracking. So almost there. Uh, but the other part of our company, uh, what I call our supply chain division is what I'll be talking about more today. And that's certainly the, the part of our company, which has caught a lot more public interest. Uh, and that's where we don't actually manufacture uh, the drugs we sell, but rather we provide uh, access channel solutions to the market. Uh, so very quickly after we started uh, the process of uh, setting up our manufacturing, we realized it wasn't enough just to make the drugs. Uh, because the pharmaceutical wholesalers are under no obligation to buy them. Uh, the big pharmacy chains are under no obligation to buy them, particularly you know, for the wholesalers if their profitability is tied to having a high price. Uh, and certainly these entities, the pharmacy benefit managers, are under no obligation to put our drugs on their formulary if they're not making enough money off of the drugs. Uh, so we start, decided, hey, we're going to do all of that. Uh, you know, I, I haven't been to business school, but they tell me on the first day, they tell you that uh, they tell you that it's a good idea to do one thing and do it really well as a company. Uh, but we kind of don't have that luxury if we really want to get the drugs all the way uh, to the patient at its true cost. We kind of have to own the entire supply chain. So we are, in fact, a registered pharmaceutical wholesaler in all 50 states. Uh, we have our direct to consumer mail order part pharmacy with our fulfillment partner, TruePill. Uh, and that's, you know, been the part of our company, which has really taken off and caught in a lot of sort of uh, public interest. Uh, and then we're even offering access to our pharmacy as an employee benefit. So we are going around the, the pharmacy benefit work managers and working with large employers, insurance companies directly. And we'll be, uh, you know, sort of, you know, that's sort of happening in the background now, but we'll be announcing those programs over the, over the coming months. Uh, so, you know, why are we doing that entire second part of our business? Like what, what is the impetus, which is making us go through, through all the, the headache there and setting up, uh, these supply channels. Um, so this is a graphic, a, a famous, uh, graphic from an individual, Adam Fine, who runs uh, consultancy drug channels, and it shows a simplified version of the way money works, money flows in the pharmaceutical supply chain. And obviously this is, even in its simplified form, uh, a nightmare. 
Uh, and every time that money flows along any of these channels, a certain percentage of it gets captured. And cumulatively, the net result is a huge amount of revenue capture before anything actually gets all the way down here to the patient at the bottom. So in particular, you know, today I'd like to talk about two groups of intermediaries in the pharmaceutical supply chain, uh, which we view as having a particularly sort of pathologic role uh, in their current incarnations. Um, you know, I, I won't be touching really on pharmaceutical company practices because, you know, I feel like those stand a lot of public scrutiny as it is, and it's sort of intuitive, oh, the drug cost is is high, it's the pharmaceutical company's fault. Uh, and, you know, certainly, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are not innocent in all of this. They have their own games generally revolving around, you know, uh, extending the monopoly time they have on drugs with patents. To, but, you know, uh, sort of what skirts in the background is the role of these intermediaries, which on individual drugs can actually have a much greater impact on the price. Uh, than the actual pharmaceutical companies themselves. I'd like to, to focus the discussion today on these two groups. So beginning with the wholesalers. Um, so there's basically three big pharmaceutical wholesalers which control about 90% of the pharmaceutical wholesale marketplace. Uh, McKesson Cardinal, Amerisource Bergen and their associated uh, you know, purchasing coalitions, Red Oak, Claris One, uh, WBA. Um, you know, essentially, uh, these actors are both monopoly, you know, essentially an oligopoly, but they're also, and this took me back to Econ 101, uh, they're also monopsonies, so they're buying monopolies. Uh, essentially, if you are a generic pharmaceutical company, uh, or any pharmaceutical company, really, you really have only three clients uh, that dominate the market. Uh, so they can command extraordinary, uh, you know, pricing power. Uh, basically, if you don't sell to one of these three entities, you're cooked as a pharmaceutical company. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they are under no obligation to pass those savings on to, to end consumers, be that uh, you know, pharmacies or hospital systems. Uh, and the spread can be, you know, in some cases, extremely large. Uh, in general, you know, if you compare us to, to one of our, you know, what could be viewed as a competitor, Amazon's pharmacy, uh, you know, pill, uh, Amazon Pharmacy now formerly PillPack, you'll find our prices are generally half of what they are. Uh, and that's because they source their drugs, from my understanding, hopefully this isn't incorrect, but uh, from Cardinal. And as a rule of thumb, uh, one of the wholesalers will double the cost of a drug uh, before selling it on. Uh, so that's how we achieve lower prices by working directly with uh, the pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical companies bypassing the wholesalers. And uh, for one example of a more extreme dynamic, uh, so this is a product, albendazole, you'll notice at the bottom is our, our old company logo. Uh, so this is actually the first product we launched uh, in early 2021 under our own label uh, to get us up and off the ground as sort of a, a limited pilot. Um, and yeah, uh, what we found at the time is you know, there's a fake list price of, of $225 uh, per tablet. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later in the talk, but, you know, sort of like a charge master price that's meant to be a negotiating price. No one's actually meant to pay it. Uh, but the actual wholesale price uh, from the big three wholesalers for this product was $75 per tablet. Uh, albendazole typically uh, a treatment course for many indications is only two tablets. So they come in these little two tablet bottles. Uh, so $150 basically for a two tablet bottle. Uh, meanwhile, when we went directly to the manufacturers, we found that the actual price per tablet uh, that they were selling it for was somewhere between five and $10 a tablet. Uh, so essentially this Delta between 75 and about $10 was being captured by the wholesaler in this instance. Uh, and yeah, we were able to dramatically drop the price of this drug just by, by disintermediating the wholesalers. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, although, you know, I would argue that they capture disproportionate value from the supply chain, uh, the wholesalers do serve a function. Uh, they're essentially elaborate logistics organizations. They're, they're UPS, they're FedEx. They make sure pharmacies have their drugs. Uh, the next entity to talk about are the pharmacy benefit managers. And these ones have even 
have uh, have more questionable value in the pharmaceutical supply chain. So, what is a PBM? Uh, you know, pharmacy benefit manager. That that sounds very banal. Uh, most people on the street, if you start talking about it, fall asleep before you say the wor words pharmacy benefit manager. But they were initially set up to do paperwork for insurance companies to pay pharmacies. So, so back in the 1980s, when pharmacy benefits were a new thing on insurance, uh, drugs were beginning to get expensive at the time. Um, you know, computers were not wide as widespread as they are today. Uh, and uh, the insurance companies wanted someone to do all the paperwork associated uh, with reimbursing for each individual prescription. So these entities started up, started charging like 10 cents a claim uh, for, for doing the work. Uh, but after a few years, they realized, hey, since we're processing all the payments for drugs anyway, why don't we also negotiate the prices of the drugs with the drug companies? We can, you know, on behalf of insurance companies, coalesce all of that demand and negotiate a better price. And even better, we won't charge you anything for this negotiating service. We will only take a percentage of the savings to you as our reimbursement. So if we negotiate you know, a dollar back on the cost of this drug, we'll take 10 cents. And that way, you know, we're aligned. You know, if you make more savings, we make more money. But, you know, it very quickly became apparent, you know, how do you maximize the absolute value of your cut of a rebate as a PBM? Let's start with an absurdly high price that you're negotiating off of. And that absurdly high price is something called the average wholesale price. And we would argue that this fake sort of charge master-esque sticker price is the worst thing in pharmaceutical pricing. So for an example, uh, let's say you wanted to go out and you wanted to buy a Toyota Camry, uh, but you really dislike negotiating. You, it's uncomfortable, like the sales guy is sleazy and you're just like, you know what? Maybe I can find someone to negotiate the price of the Camry down for me. And someone comes up, the PBM comes up and it's like, hey, I'll do the negotiation for you. Uh, and you know what? You don't even have to pay me. I'll just take a percentage of what I save you. And you go, great. Uh, this is gonna make my life a lot easier. And the PBM comes back and it says, hey, I did something amazing. I negotiated a 90% discount for you off the price of the Toyota Camry. And you go, oh, that's amazing. How did you possibly do that? And they're like, don't worry about it. This is our job. We're very good at it. But then you realize the sticker price of the Toyota Camry was a million dollars. And you're left paying $100,000 for the Toyota Camry. And the PBM keeps the difference between the $25,000 real cost and the $10,000. And although this may seem like an extreme dynamic, it, it winds up taking place over and over again on you know, literally millions of times every day uh, in the pharmaceutical pricing world. Now, you know, uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, we uh, are for the first time in a domain where the US government uh, is meant to be able to negotiate the price of certain drugs uh, but we already have uh, negotiators on our behalf, the PBMs, uh, and they control, the big three PBMs control 80 plus percent of the market. So together they have enormous uh, negotiating leverage, but at the same time, we pay 2.56 times more for pharmaceuticals per capita than comparable nations. So I would argue that, you know, if we do have negotiators out there on our behalf, they're doing a terrible job at it. Uh, you know, certainly we as the United States should have more negotiating leverage than, you know, Lithuania, let's say. At the same time, um, an audit performed by the uh, Attorney General of the state of Ohio uh, found that PBM spread equated to 31.4% of spending on generic drugs by Ohio managed Medicaid plans. So one out of every $3 that was spent in Ohio by Medicaid actually went directly to, to the, the PBMs. So obviously this, this seems uh, a bit of an egregious practice and several states, policymakers, regulators have stepped in uh, going from the state level. Uh, it was even proposed, proposed by CMS that this practice of spread pricing, uh, that the practice of capturing rebate dollars uh, should end, that pharmacy rebate should, should be regulated away uh, with mixed success throughout the country. 
So pharmacy benefit managers decided, hey, let's get out ahead of this. You know what? We're going to proactively say we're, we're not taking any more of the rebate dollars. Uh, we're going to pass through 100% of rebates that we capture directly to plan sponsors, the people paying for insurance. But suddenly, new fees started popping up. If, uh, you know, they pass through 100% of rebates, but they do not pass through 100% of effective rate clawbacks, which are obviously very different from rebates, as is differential pricing. And you know, here's a, a slide from, from Nephron Research, which shows the source of PBM revenues over the past, <laughs> past few years. And uh, you can see that uh, the percentage of profits that come from spread pricing from rebates have gone down dramatically over the past six years or so. At the same time, the percentage of profits which are attributable to fees have gone up dramatically as, and keep this, we'll keep a pin in this one for now, but, <coughs> but the percentage of profits attributable to specialty pharmacies owned by the PBMs themselves have also gone up uh, dramatically over that same period. And overall PBM profits have also gone up uh, overall as a, as a proportion during this time. So now PBMs say they pass along 100% of rebates but rebate aggregators don't. Uh, so rebate aggregators are subsidiary corporations, wholly owned subsidiaries uh, created by the PBMs, which are all domiciled in Switzerland where their books can never be audited. Uh, and which it is unclear, you know, what percentage of rebate dollars are captured by these rebate aggregators because it is very opaque. Uh, but it's thought that somewhere around 8% of all rebate dollars. And remember, if the rebate is 90%, that's almost the entire, you know, you're basically almost doubling the price of the drug at that point to capture 8% of the rebate dollars uh, is captured by these mysterious rebate aggregators. So here I almost verge into the conspiratorial. Uh, so these are the, the rebate aggregators associated with each of the big three PBMs, CBS, Caremark, Express Scripts, and Optum. And by revenue dollars, these must be some of the largest companies on, on earth, basically. They all must have revenue uh, in the range of hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, but no one's ever heard of them. Uh, none of them have web pages. Uh, Ascent is the only one I could find a logo for. So, you know, this does not, this level of transparency does not uh, assuage concerns. Let me put it that way. And here we are talking about the fees again. Uh, so uh, as mentioned, the rebate dollars are going down, but for the privilege of doing business with the PBMs, the amount of fees that the pharmaceutical companies actually have to pay to the PBMs directly have gone up dramatically in the past few years. Uh, so here is just a few of the fees that we have seen paid by pharmaceutical companies, again, for the privilege of doing business with the PBMs. Uh, market share incentives, uh, promotional allowances, market share utilization costs, drug pull through programs, rebate submission fees, formulary placement fees, administrative fees, price concessions, performance-based incentives, data fees, health management fees, educational fees. Uh, and again, all of these, uh, even in you know, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, uh, put in some language that mandated disclosure of PBMs of rebate dollars, uh, actually not PBMs, actually on the brokers that managed the relationships with the PBMs said that the brokers had to pass through some level of transparency. But all of these that are de facto uh, bona fide, or sorry, rather bona fide service fees do not have to be transparently passed through and these have gone up dramatically. At the same time, remember we mentioned a few slides ago, uh, this concept of specialty pharmacies owned by the PBMs are a huge source of revenue. Uh, so each of the PBMs owns their own pharmacy. That seems like a relatively counterintuitive because the purpose of the PBMs, at least nominally, is to negotiate with pharmacies. They're meant to be the negotiator. Literally, it's in the name, pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, but, but they all actually own their own pharmacies. Uh, and funny story, all of the most expensive drugs tend to be distributed through the PBM owned specialty pharmacies. They can even mandate uh, that the expensive drugs are sold exclusively uh, through their specialty pharmacy. 
So what we find is um, that 50, this is data from the state of Florida, uh, for commercial players uh, of all drugs that are over $1,000 a claim, 51% of them are sold through PBM specialty pharmacies uh, as compared to 11% of drugs, which are less than $1,000 a claim. Uh, so of these drugs, which are over $1,000 a claim, uh, you know, the average profit is $3,400 per prescription. And uh, this is a, another example, again, from Florida Medicaid, uh, about one product specifically. So this is a Gleevec, a generic Gleevec, imatinib. Uh, so this is an example which is near and dear to our heart at Mark Cuban Cost Plus. Uh, you know, again, going directly to the manufacturers, uh, we were able to get this product at the moment for about you know, $30 for a month's supply. Uh, we retail it after our 15% markup, $3 pharmacy fee at $39 for a month's supply. Uh, most places you'll find it are, are somewhere between 100, cash pay, you know, pharmacies somewhere between 100, $150 for a month's supply. And that again, going back to the beginning of the talk, that Delta is, be, is primarily the, the wholesalers capture is between that 150 and our $39. But once you add in the PBM margin, it becomes egregious. Um, so the average wholesale price of imatinib, generic imatinib is still $10,000 for a month's supply. Now, let's say you negotiate a 90% rebate on the price of generic imatinib, that's still $1,000. Uh, then, you know, the PBM's costs or you know, percentage capture of spread or rebate in there winds up being, say, 10% of uh, the actual rebate dollars. Uh, and what patients tell us over and over and over again is their actual adjudicated price. Uh, so the price they're actually asked to pay out of pocket if they're on a high deductible plan, if they haven't reached their deductible yet, is between $2,000 and $3,200, depending on their PBM. Uh, for that month's supply of imatinib. Uh, and that delta between $3,000 and you know, $40 or $39, I mean, someone's capturing that money and it's not the pharmacy and it's not the pharmaceutical manufacturer. So presumably all of that is going to the PBM. But even more on top of that, uh, in Florida Medicaid, uh, at one of the big, uh, bigger PBM, Centene, actually mandated that all imatinib scripts had to be filled as a specialty product at their own pharmacy. So they would capture even more margin on top of that. And you found that, you know, that they were actually charging $4,400 for a month supply of imatinib because they can, you know, they can mandate uh, which pharmacy the patient uses for complicated specialty products. Uh, and then they can negotiate whatever price they like with themselves. Uh, so you find even higher costs. So you find even more egregious costs at pharmacies owned by the PBMs themselves. So all of this, uh, you know, comes to a situation that I like to refer to as essentially whack-a-mole scams. Uh, essentially, you start with individual scams, but new one. And policymakers, regulators, you know, find out about them maybe a couple of years down the line, pass regulations or create policy to try to get rid of the scams and just new ones keep popping up over and over again. Be they, you know, the ones that are sort of trending at the moment are these concept of co-payment maximizers, which again are just another way, really at the end of the day is this elaborate process to reclassify rebate dollars over and over again. Uh, so our... You know, the only solution we have around this is uh, to basically just reinvent the supply chain as a whole, go back to a go back to a retail model. And this is why we're going through all this hassle of basically building everything, up, you know, a parallel supply chain out internally that can just bypass all of this gamesmanship and nonsense um, all the way from the level of the manufacturer to the patient and even working with their insurance company. And this, you know, arguably this, this is a little unfair because of all the, the mergers in the industry, but, uh, you know, for a se broad sense of where value is captured in the, uh, in the uh, pharmaceutical supply chain, 
this is a, a graph of stock prices of various industry actors over time. So you can see if you invested in a basket of pharmacy stocks uh, back in 2006 and held them, uh, you would actually be down about 30%. So pharmacy hasn't been, hasn't been a great industry. Uh, meanwhile, if you purchased pharmaceutical company stocks, you'd be doing pretty well. Uh, so you'd be up about 150% over that same time period. Meanwhile, if you had a basket of PBM managed care stocks, you'd be up almost 600% over that same time period. Uh, so, you know, again, an indirect sort of proxy metric, but you know, certainly the, the market seem to think the best business to be in in the pharmaceutical industry is this space of, of, of managing the payments themselves rather than, than actually making the drugs. Uh, and with that, that's kind of the, the end of my talk. Uh, and yeah, would love to, to open it up to, to questions and more discussion about how we work at Mark Cuban Cost Plus. Wow. Well, I think uh, I got a few texts during that, and uh, I think uh, it was an eye opener for some folks. Um, I'd uh, love to turn it over to Vincent, uh, to Vincent Betterraj Kumar, and just get kind of your thoughts and see if you had anything to add, because uh, you obviously have been very interested in this space for a number of years. Well, thanks so much, Samir. And um... Alex, that was an amazing presentation. I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot. Um, you know, I got interested in the cost of drugs when uh, I was, I, I led the trial that got thalidomide approved by the FDA. And then the cousin of thalidomide, lenalidomide, was a drug that I worked on and, and led the first phase two trial. And I saw the price of Revlimid when they launched was like 4,500 and then every year it will go up. And that caused me to think about the whole pricing situation. Here's a drug that should be dirt cheap, but it's costing the moon and the price still keeps increasing. Um, you know, in 2012, we wrote an article in the proceedings, uh, Mayo Clinic proceedings, the high cost of cancer drugs and what we can do about it. And one of the solutions I wrote there was somebody has to do a nonprofit manufacturing. And that's exactly what you started. So, I mean, it's just so impressive that you have taken an idea that you had all this way through. And I, I have no doubt countless patients in the United States are benefiting from your venture already. And there's many more to come. So kudos to you. I just want to thank you for that. You've made a lot of uh, important points. I think um, uh, the, the whole supply chain profits from a high price, except for the patient from the pharmaceutical manufacturer to the wholesaler, to the PBM, to the pharmacy, everyone manufactures. And then there's all this vertical integration where the PBM owns the pharmacy. Therefore, even if the pharmacy profits down, well, the PBM's making money and the whole overall holding company makes money. It's all very uh, complicated. Um, what I've been struck by is how much patients are unaware of all of these things. And that's what's really sad is like they have no idea that the same prescription going to your pharmacy could save them 90% or 99% than if it went somewhere else. And it's even more uh, difficult for me to admit that doctors are also unaware. They're, they're just prescribing whatever comes on the screen without even knowing how much anything costs or who's getting reimbursed for what. So I think there's a lot of education to do. Thanks for speaking. We'll see what questions people have, but I just want everybody here on the audience to realize this is an important problem. The more you read up and the more you learn about it, the better uh, from a healthcare provider standpoint. And it's, it's just important that we talk to our patients about access and affordability and be willing to explore these options, particularly if they have problems too. One question I would have for you, Alex, is you know, clearly for patients who are uninsured, your pharmacy is by far the best place to go for generic drugs. So the question is, there are, however, drugs like Gleevec for even insured patients. Uh, their copay or their overall deductible or everything could be for the whole year much higher than if they just went to you. So if you could put a list of the most common drugs for which insurance, even if you have it, will, will not save you money. And uh, so people like in clinical practice know which of these drugs they should really watch out for. 
uh, Gleevec being one of the top examples and, and, and others that they can certainly look to you even for an insured patient. And then I hope sooner or later you will have insulin and you will have some brand name drugs and any ideas you have on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I, this sounds like just sort of a thing you say because it sounds good, but I've genuinely been surprised by how popular the uptake at our uh, cash pay, you know, uh, pharmacy has been. And part of it is, you know, we have, when we launched, we had about a dozen products that fall into that category of drugs where we have by far the best price, uh, whether you have insurance or not. Um, you know, that's imatinib, misalmine, colchicine, oral vancomycin. You know, we have, and I expected our, our site would be popular for those drugs, and, and it has been. They're mo you know, several of our best sellers are, are those products. Um, but what I was genuinely surprised by, um, so we added also the most commonly prescribed generic drugs in the US uh, as well. Uh, so, you know, your beta blockers, your statins, you know, very, com you know, drugs, which if you know, you can get pretty cheaply anywhere with uh, a discount card or even just asking a pharmacist, hey, can I pay cash? Uh, so we added those mostly as a convenience, like, you know, if you're purchasing your matnib and you need, uh, you know, you need your statin refilled at the same time, we can do that for you. Uh, what kind of blew me is away is I did not realize how ripped off patients were getting even on those very commonly prescribed drugs. Uh, one of our initial best sellers, and still to this day, is a generic Rusava statin, uh, so generic Crestor. Um, and, you know, obviously available for pennies almost anywhere. Uh, but it turned out uh, Express Scripts was adjudicating it at $200 for a month's supply. Uh, so if you went in with your Express, you know, uh, insurance card, and you know, just naively were like, okay, I need my, my statin refilled, uh, you know, and you hadn't had a high deductible plan, uh, you would be asked to pay that $200. And most patients, you know, most doctors are unaware of this. I'd never heard of a PBM before I started down this path. Like in 2015, I never heard those words put together in that order before. Um, like what hope does an individual patient have? Um, so, you know, they would go, to, they would just go, oh, okay, $200. Well, drugs are expensive. What am I to do? Uh, and, you know, one of the things which I think has, you know, been a positive, pleasant surprise to us is that just Mark through his celebrity is able to communicate the fact that there are alternatives out there in a way that, you know, other actors in the pharma, in the, the medical world uh, really can't. Uh, people recognize him from his TV show. And if he says, hey, there are more affordable medications here, he's just better at communicating it than other actors. So hopefully we can begin to, to educate, um, you know, both the practitioner and the patient community that, you know, alternatives are out there. We have a slew of questions, <laughs> absolute okay. slew that's building up. But before that, I wanted to uh, see if either Dr. Rosenthal, Dr. Nani, or Dr. Sekulik had any comments or questions before we start getting into this uh, long list. I think there's some really, really exciting questions in the in the yeah. uh, chat and the Q&A. I'm just going to ask one uh, quick one. So do you, do you envision, given that some of the costs for drugs are probably cheaper for generics, uh, mm -hmm. going straight through a company like yours or, or a pricing like yours versus even with insurance. Do you, do you see this disrupting the insurance markets where people may insure for, you know, uh, brand name drugs that are not uh, generic yet, but decide to do everything else <laughs> out of pocket? Uh, you know, I think it depends on the insurance company. Uh, so, you know, for insurance companies, uh, they don't like overpaying for medications either. Uh, so we're, you know, they have hired independent analysts. Uh, so there was a study, uh, you know, on our program done by some researchers, um, Aaron Kesselheim's group uh, at, at uh, Harvard School of Public Health uh, that found we would save uh, managed Medicare plans about 30% on their generic drug spends. Um, you know, that did not come as a surprise to me because simultaneously independent consultants for, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield plans were evaluating our program and found for commercial plans we would save them somewhere between 50 and 60% on their generic drug spend if they purchase through us uh, as opposed to uh, you know, conventional channels. Um, you know, taking the, med the imatinib example again, um, 
if you are not on a high deductible plan and it's ultimately the insurance company that has to pay the $2,3200, why wouldn't you direct all the patients that you could to purchase it through our site with a, with a zero dollar copayment? Uh, so I actually think we'll begin integrating uh, with those insurance companies that are willing to work with us around their existing PBM relationships. Uh, we'll hopefully we'll announce the first partnership in the next month or so, and then a whole bunch more starting in the new year to just sort of the cycle of these things. Uh, there are certain insurance companies that own the big PBMs. Uh, you know, I probably, you know, not picking, maybe not singling them out specifically, but why not? Uh, you know, United Healthcare and Optum, obviously. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say we're not going to get any, any of any United Healthcare's business. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, you know, more broadly, there's a lot of insurance companies out there. And I think a lot of them are actually excited to partner with us. It's a, uh... Well, before we get into this, there's a one theme that came up multiple times, but I do need to ask, I had a, this week, um, uh, so in preparation, uh, one of the nurses I work with uh, who has excellent insurance um, went on the Cost Plus Pharmacy and found that for her and her husband, they would save money actually going to you, to your point. They have a daughter who takes a medicine that I'm not familiar with for dyslexia. Um, that you do carry, but when they tried to fill it, it was a pediatric, I guess for under 18, yeah. they couldn't get it filled. And I know that's, so that's going to be a concern. I mean, not a concern. That's a hope I'm sure for many families. Uh, could you comment on that? Oh, sure. Uh, so it's actually more of an IT technical issue on our site, you know, linking accounts for dependents, for minors with their, you know, guardians accounts. Uh, but we're working through that. Uh, we're hoping okay. to have that capability online probably January uh, at this point. Um, yeah, uh, sort of we're slow, you know, again, we were almost caught by some, maybe we shouldn't have been, uh, you know, you always underestimate the, you know, your own potential for success. Uh, you know, uh, we're kind of caught a, off guard by how much interest there was in the site. So we're sort of building out different capabilities uh, over time. Um, Dr. Bill Lubber has been a radi radiologist who works with us, uh, so one of your kindred folks, um, asked, amongst others, uh, asked about the new Inflation Reduction Act and affecting this cost paradigm. And I guess this gets us into the bigger question that was also asked by other um, people about just the legislative and legal challenges in the PBM lobbying budget that you must be running into on a daily basis. Yeah, you know, at a at a high level, we try not to take policy positions ourselves or or advocate for them, which may sound counterintuitive. Uh, but you know, essentially, my viewpoint is uh, I'm a radiologist from Central Montana. Like no one care, no one in Washington cares what I think about policy, uh, and less you know glibly. Like there there are so many organizations out there fighting on behalf of people. You know, everything from you know, Arnold Ventures to giant patient organizations, advocacy groups. There are so many people out there that are fighting that good fight um, that, eh, you know, are, are, you know, I, you know, I don't think it's kind of the best use of our resources to, to fight in those policy battles. Uh, we're just sort of on the periphery, like, you know, I can't force Congress to change anything, but I can just sell cheap drugs less expensively. Like that is within the powers that I have. So, you know, that's kind of our, very much our, our focus. Uh, on the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, you know, I'll be honest, I, I have it open on my screen all the time since it was passed last week, but I, you know, 700 pages, I still have to read it. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, at a high level, I think it's great. Uh, you know, it is, from my understanding, this may have changed when it finally passed. So please forgive me if I get this wrong. Uh, but it's limited to a small subset of negotiating for generic products to start with. Uh, and, you know, if it's 20 generic products to start with, you know, we already have a thousand on our site. So it might be more limited in its scope than would be ideal. But hey, any, anything's a step in the right direction. Uh, Vincent, if you wanted to add anything. So, you know, I'm surprised that actually on Twitter, there's so many people, the public who are not aware of actually what the Inflation Reduction Act has and will carry. So, number one, very quickly in two minutes, um, Medicare will start negotiating for prescription drugs starting in 2026. And that won't be just for generics, but any drug that Medicare spends a lot of money on. Like the top 10 drugs includes some generics, some also like Revlimid, which are 
still only brand name. And they will pick those drugs and they'll start negotiating in 2026. They will also cap the price of uh, increase, like, you know, every year drug companies increase the price for no reason. Uh, and that would be capped to no more than inflation for and any penalties that will be paid. But this applies only for Medicare, uh, what is sold to Medicare, not for private insurance that was struck off the bill. The most important thing that patients need to know is that right now, 1.3 million people pay more than $6,350 uh, out of pocket for their prescription meds on Part D. Now that is the catastrophic limit. Now, anything more than that, there is no cap. You can keep on paying. You can pay 10,000, 20,000, and it'll still go on. That cap, uh, that 5% cost sharing that is there for people who spend more than 6,350 is going away. So the maximum somebody will spend in 2024 is 6,350. In 2025, no one will spend more than 2,000 for Part D drugs. And that's the biggest benefit for patients. And that includes all the drugs that they are covered under for Part D. So just simple clarification on what the act includes. Now, people have asked me which drug is covered because I heard only 10 drugs are covered, but the 10 drugs is for what Medicare will negotiate for. You as a consumer, as a beneficiary of Medicare, all your prescription drugs through Part D will be capped for the whole year. Your payment will be no more than 2000 and that 2000 will be spread throughout the year. You don't need to spend all the 2000 in January. The donut <laughs> is going away. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, <clears throat> from a hematologist, Dr. Marwan Sheikh, thank you for the great talk. What challenges do you have when it comes to acquiring more non-generic medications? Uh, for example, Xeralto, Eliquis, Pradaxa, very common and critical medications for people. Um, Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we are working uh, with brand name pharmaceutical companies now. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think we'll be adding our first brand name products in the next month or two onto our website. Uh, look out for those announcements. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, essentially, it took us going back to get our first generic product, albendazole, uh, took us a year to convince a pharmaceutical company to to work with us on that. Uh, and the reason there is, you know, we show the prices on our website. We have our, if you scroll down to the bottom of each product page, we'll show you what our act, what we actually purchased it for. And it took quite a bit of convincing for generic companies to, you know, be willing to reveal their costs. Um, and, uh, you know, after that, uh, we were able to talk three other generic companies into doing it and, uh, you know, launched a hundred products the next year. And now, you know, we have, I think, 16, 17 companies that are on board uh, and over a thousand products. So really, it's just uh, the hesitation around the, the status quo. Like if it's working for, you know, kind of the devil, you know, is better than the, the devil you don't know kind of thing. Um, so, you know, it's mostly been talking pharmaceutical companies into the value of, of sort of taking the risk uh, on on working with Mark Cuban Cost Plus. But uh, you know, hopefully the same dynamic will work with brand products that uh, work with uh, generic products. And uh, yeah, hopefully after our first few rollouts, we should have significantly more uh, coming on board uh, in the, the months and years to follow. Yeah, you touched on this, um, but uh, the question came up on ETA for injectables like epinephrine and insulin. Uh, you know, we're constantly working on it. Uh, I don't think we're ready to announce anything quite yet because you know we never announce anything we're working on until it launches just because like you know we don't want to get people's hopes up and then it's delayed for a few months for whatever reason and you know but uh, but stay tuned to this channel let me put it that way and maybe on that note i know but i think what's the best way for people to follow uh, mark cuban because you don't advertise yeah. uh, what is the best for the listener out there what's the best way to follow um, what's happening with the Cost Plus Pharmacy? Well, sure. Uh, so actually, through probably through our social media channels, to be honest. Uh, so more professionally, there is a, a link on our website. Um, if you scroll to the bottom, where you can add your email address and be added to our newsletter, uh, and we'll, you know, email updates uh, directly through that channel. Uh, but you know, either our Twitter, you know, Facebook, Instagram. 
my employee, younger employees keep bugging me to, to add a company TikTok. Uh, so I, I struggle with dancing, so I'm not sure how well that'll go. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, social media, honestly, it's, it's very powerful. Uh, and that's how most of the word gets out about us. Yeah. Maybe, uh, one of the, the themes that I've seen here uh, in the questions uh, to ask, uh, people are sometimes cautious about or, or concerned about the source of the drugs. And, uh, you know, we know that many patients will obtain expensive drugs from Canada, for example, today, rather than in the U.S., but even those <coughs> drugs from different sources, some are made in Canada, some are made in, uh, you know, India or uh, Turkey and so on. How uh, can you comment on that? What are the sources of drugs and how are those vetted? Oh, sure. Uh, so, you know, our company motto is actually quality and safety are everything. Um, you know, in, in my view, like if we have any quality and safety issues at all, we're dead because then suddenly we're the company that's low cost because they skimp on, on safety and, you know, first do no harm. I'm a doctor. Absolutely not. Uh, so unique amongst pharmaceutical wholesalers, we actually do independent laboratory tests on the products we purchase. I think we're the only ones that, that do that. And we send, you know, a random sampling of our products to an independent testing lab to make sure it has you know, no contaminants in them. It actually has the amount of active pharmaceutical ingredient it's meant to have. Uh, and we actually, and uh, if it doesn't, you know, we uh, block those, those products from our, from our inventory. Uh, you know, that being said, uh, something, uh, you know, I think the numbers are unclear. People are trying to research this and it's a bit of a struggle, but it's thought that somewhere between 80 and 90% of our pharmaceuticals are made in either India or China in some combination uh, jurisdictions with, which may have laxer regulatory constraints. Uh, you know, all our products are obviously FDA approved. All the facilities that make them are FDA inspected. Uh, you know, we have as our director of quality and safety, a former FDA inspector himself. Um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's just kind of reality that, you know, at the moment, if you, if you want to have medications, most of them are probably going to come from, you know, the API, the ingredients, the, the chemicals are probably going to come from China and the final dosage form is probably going to come from India. And there's just no practical way around that at the moment. Um, that being said, you know, obviously I'm biased. I'm a U.S. based pharmaceutical manufacturer, uh, like, uh, but it, it doesn't seem terribly jingoistic to say that perhaps it's not a great idea for our greatest geostrategic rival to be producing all of our antibiotics. Uh, like if, if they ever wanted to, they could just, yeah, that's, it's not great. Not great. <clears throat> um, a, a couple of questions have come up on uh, uh, if you are okay, if we could post this talk um, mm -hmm. and it, I, we, there's a few steps for us to do that. Probably the best way then um, if for the few people that asked, or I'm sure there's more people that are interested is um, perhaps, uh, well, this sounds self-promoting, uh, but either follow, I think Vincent Rajkumar on Twitter or myself on Twitter or any of us, I'm sure you, and, and, um, and then we can post the link uh, when it's ready on some social media, including those through Mayo Clinic. And I'm sure Vincent and myself can also post. Um, uh, the, uh, have you discussed uh, publishing some of this cost savings is, and really the talk you gave is worthy of an academic manuscript. Have you considered, you know, writing this up, publishing it in scientific journals like Mayo Clinic Proceedings um, to maybe raise awareness within the, uh, uh, provider, the, the provider community? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely would be open to that. Uh, you know, I think, you know, it kind of pains me to say as someone who once had pretensions of uh, becoming a, you know, academic and becoming a full professor one day, you know, I sort of fell off that that track entirely. Uh, but, you know, we try, you know, because it would be inherently biased if it comes from us, you know, we try not to, to pub, you know, attempt to publish in academic journals just because, you know, if it if it's me saying how great my company is, you know, like, uh, you know, there's a obvious caveat there. But, you know, if we can provide data for independent researchers uh, who want to do their own analysis, you know, we try to be as transparent as, as possible. Uh, you know, all our pricing is on our web page, but we also have it available in easier to analyze formats, um, you know, Excel files and, instead of like having to go through each like web page and click on the button. Uh, so yeah, if there's, um, uh, you know, data we could send to, to researchers who'd be interested in doing analyses, uh, yeah, we'd love to, love to discuss. 
There's a question from Gloria Marlowe. Uh, you mentioned the cost to Florida Medicaid programs as an example. Are you negotiating with any um, states at large? How about large organizations? Example, Kaiser Permanent. Uh, so the latter, yes. Uh, so we're talking to, to large self-insured employer employers and uh, you know, very, you know, insurance networks. Um, those will probably be to start with um, commercial plans as opposed to government sponsored plans. Uh, part of it is it's just easier. There's uh, miscellaneous sort of bureaucratic things you need to do to work with government sponsored plans. And we're certainly by no means opposed to it. We will get there. Uh, but, you know, uh, for example, uh, for Medicare plans, you need to keep up with these things called star ratings, uh, which are various metrics you have to meet in order to, to work uh, with government sponsored insurance plans, which involve setting up like dedicated call centers, to, just as an example, to call patients after they receive their prescription to verify that they got it. And, you know, in some percentage of the time, so just as additional administrative burden, uh, you know, is something, makes it something that takes a little bit more time. Uh, so, but, you know, we will get there, uh, but uh, sort of the low hanging fruit is the commercial plan. So that's probably where, where we'll start. Uh, this is an interesting question from Dr. Samir Beg. Um, Direct primary care physicians have been commonly uh, have been getting commonly prescribed drugs from wholesalers, example Andamed, for years, and passing on considerable savings to their patients. Would you be willing to sell directly to physicians for in-office dispensing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we get that question a lot, um, and you know, I think it, it's again uh, a matter of sort of resources. You know, it just we've we're doing a lot, uh, like setting up, I can tell you, like, uh, I was literally crawling around on my hands and knees looking at like little bumps and defects in the floor of our pharmaceutical manufacturing plant. Uh, because in a sterile facility, like any little defect uh, is a place for bacteria to hide. So we're literally, myself and my chief engineer, we're circling little, in a red Sharpie pen, like little dots, uh, which is just my way of saying like, we're stretched pretty thin, uh, but hopefully as we grow, we'll work up to that uh, sort of wholesaling cap capabilities, both to large institutional systems. Uh, we've had a surprising amount of demand from, uh, you know, large health systems who pharmacy officers who've looked at our site and say, wait a second, your pricing is better than what I'm getting from McKesson. Like, why don't we just buy through you? And, uh, you know, my answer is please do uh, give us a little bit of time, <laughs> you know, as we build out more and more infrastructure, we'll, we'll hopefully get there that we can wholesale both to health systems, uh, independent pharmacies, and certainly uh, uh, physician dispensing programs as well. I think the only caveat is that anyone, anytime you do that, there is markups yeah. that these intermediaries will add on, whether it's physicians, pharmacies, unfortunately, healthcare systems. And then what you want to sell for five dollars will be sold to the patient for 25 and and all they did was buy and sell and so you may have to make sure that there's some enforcement of what you sold them for is what the patient's getting it for and they're providing a service because otherwise they don't have any major benefit other than direct the patient to you no absolutely uh that is actually you know so our initial product albendazole we didn't retail that ourselves to our own pharmacy uh, we instead uh, tried to sell it to other pharmacies uh, to sell on to patients. Um, and, you know, we advertised this is the price. This is, you know, our MSRP, like this is what you should sell it for. And it wound up being a little hit or miss if the, you know, pharmacy act, it was about 50-50, like when we did sort of a secret shopper tests, if they actually passed on the savings. Uh, so we are investigating, like, one, we're hoping transparency will you know, be sort of a self-enforcement mechanism, uh, but moreover, like certain contracting mechanisms for when we do wholesale, like are there ways we can actually ensure if you wanna be part of a Mark Cuban program that the savings will get passed along to the, the people we're intending it to be the savings for. Absolutely. There's one uh, very interesting question, which I think is the logical next step uh, from one of our uh, esteemed uh, pharmacists here, Adriana Kekic, and she's asking whether, um, uh, considering the brand name drugs represent a significant uh, pr proportion of drug expenditures in this country, any thoughts on how does this kind of a model expand to brand name drugs? Oh, sure. Um, 
you know, that 50, 60% savings uh, that we're offering on generic drugs probably won't get up to the same level on the brand name drugs. Um, you know, uh, the numbers I've seen generally generic drugs are about 10 to 20% of overall drug spend. Uh, they tend to be 90% of prescriptions, but the remaining 10 are actually, you know, 80 to 90% of overall spend. I think from our, the discussions we're having so far, our percentage savings on those brand products will probably be more along the lines of uh, 10 to 30%. Uh, but in terms of raw dollars, uh, that you know, ten percent, thirty percent savings on, you know, brand products a lot may actually dwarf uh, the fifty percent savings on generic products. Um, again, as we pick targets to go after, you know, it's sort of we try to go after the low hanging fruit first, and certainly the generics are are there. Uh, but you know, hopefully we'll we'll get to the brand stuff pretty shortly. We're. Um... We're actually past time, but I, and we're not going to be able to get all, to all these questions. It's just simply too much. Um, any uh, last minute comments or questions uh, from uh, my co-panelists and colleagues at Mayo? I'll just say a fantastic talk, Alex. And I think uh, the, the comments about should, should this be published, should this be broadly available? Yeah. You know, for education of patients, for education of pro providers, tells you how 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 much thirst there is for this type of information, and understanding how to do this better. Oh, uh, thank you guys so much for for having me. Uh, I'll just end by saying, if you're interested in prescribing drugs to our patients, uh, I would say we're in most of the major EMRs now. Uh, so if your facility is on Epic, Cerner, uh, Meditech, you know, we're in all of those. Uh, if you just look up Mark Cuban uh, in the search function for a pharmacy, we should be in there. Uh, the only caveat I will add is it helps us a lot if you include your patient's email address uh, because that helps us link up with their account. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, uh, yeah, please have a look. Well, thanks again. Hopefully this is not a one-time engagement, but this is the beginning of a dialogue because I think uh, we really we really would like to bring you on site at one oh, of the absolutely. Uh, three sites. And uh, I think there's a lot of work. Um, I think it would be great to continue the dialogue. But, uh, no, thank you for taking it. the time to join us. Um, and thanks to my fellow co-panelists. And I hope everyone has a great Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.